Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Well, a lot of you have asked me to go ahead and do a deep dive into the evidence. Even my patrons have asked for a deeper analysis, uh, just going through the evidence kind of in a much deeper way. And so we're going to kick off the series starting in the bedroom. Now, something to keep in the back of your minds, and this is an issue that's come up both on YouTube. Someone uh, made a comment about it. What actually happened to Shanann's clothes? The clothing that she arrived in, what happened to, to it? And so that is something we're going to address in this episode. It's a great question. Uh, it's also a good question to ask what happened to the, the girls' clothing, the girls' blankets, the girls' shoes, the girls' toys, um, you know, what, what actually left the house when they left. Uh, the same applies to Chris Watts. What clothes was he wearing when he left and what happened to, to that clothing? So, great question. Um, on Patreon, someone else asked a really good question, just asking about Shanann's iWatch, showing that she that the watch went up two flights of stairs and so and whereas Chris Watts's watch went went up 11 flights of stairs that morning um, and what can we glean from that now I must say at the beginning of this case even before the discovery came out there was a lot of discussion about Vivint about the ring doorbell camera about the GPS data about the iPhone um, uh, information about the iWatch, uh, I guess, biometrics. And altogether, I was looking forward to an incredible court case where you're going to see how the uh, data analysis was, it was going to be, in my opinion, one of the, f the first um, truly digital um, court cases in terms of the evidence where the digital archive was going to give you, besides the body cam, and besides the phone data review, you're going to get this incredible um, uh, portrait of what happened through other digital um, uh, information. For example, the Vivint layer, the GPS data, and uh, as I say, the iWatch data and so on. And so I was really looking forward to that. I think this case would have been one of the, the most... Um, um, uh, digitally illustrated cases in true crime history had it gone to trial um, especially if we include the social media aspect in that uh, in that description bear in mind from a true crime perspective social media gives you what someone is wearing it gives you a timestamp. it also gives you to some extent the demeanor of what someone uh, appears um, whether over um, a period of time or on a specific day so um, there is definitely some utility to to the social media aspect speaking of which on Shanann social media she actually posted a picture when she was in North Carolina of the shirt she was wearing on the night that she was murdered so there you get a very clear image of the that that shirt that she was wearing and of course this isn't the same shirt she was wearing when her body was exhumed at the well site uh, the shirt she was wearing there was a victoria's secret shirt sort of uh, less gray than that but sort of a kind of a purple shirt going into into gray so purple and gray and then it had like a silver heart insignia emblazoned on it before we begin with today's walkthrough if you haven't subscribed to the channel please do like share leave a comment if you do share please use the hashtag tcrs and let's get started is any of her clothes anything like that missing It didn't look like she went through and packed up no, I mean, a bag or anything. This, this and all that in the bottom, so it'd be kind of hard to tell if she took a little bit or, I mean, it'd be easy to tell if she took a lot, but it's hard to tell if she took a little bit or not. Okay. Did she tell you anything about leaving, moving out? Not moving out. I mean, the last time I talked to her was this morning. She said she's going to take 
the kids to a friend's house and she asked where she was going to be. And then I've texted her today and never heard anything. But the car's, the car's here. The car's right. here. Unless somebody came and picked her up. But the people that I know, nobody's heard from her, nobody's seen her. Right. Who do, who do you guys bank with? Chase and USA. So it's very interesting when you compare the sort of three or four layers that we have. First of all, the body cam. Second of all, when you sort of freeze frame and you, you sort of look at photos of the, of the crime scene. Uh, thirdly, you look at what's in the discovery. And finally, you look at what we ultimately know that, that Chris Watts did murder his family and we know where he took their bodies. So if you put all four of those dimensions together, it's quite interesting what you sort of come up with. Uh, each piece of the puzzle on its own is important, but it's not really enough. Um, the one piece informs the other piece. So in terms of this video, and I'll, I'll put a link to it in the description, it sort of kicks off at about 39.30 um, on, on Officer Coonrod's body cam. And basically what happens is he walks to Chris Watts' side of the bed, the left side, and he's standing there when he says to him something like, have you, you know, do, do you know if any of her clothes are missing? And what's very interesting at this point is now bear in mind this is moments after they've, everyone has accessed the crime scene. So it's early on Monday afternoon very shortly after his arrival and they're now in the bedroom the officer is standing on Chris Watts' side of the bed um, very close to the pillows and and debris on the floor which we'll get to in a moment and the next thing Chris Watts sort of walks off he walks into the bathroom so in other words when the officer asks him the question his way of answering it is to sort of walk away into the bathroom uh, past the laundry basket which comes up on the 14th but we'll get to that and he goes into kind of like a walk-in closet or wardrobe um, it's easy to get confused and i certainly got confused between this closet which has got his shirts color coordinated on the left side and then her blouses and clothing also color coordinated on the right hand side the background color to the walls of this particular room is sort of like a purple color um, but it is easy to get confused with the uh, kind of um, shoe what do they call it a, a shoe wardrobe or whatever shoe shoe cupboard uh, downstairs that's filled it's like a room that connects to Shanann's office that is just full of uh, high-heeled shoes and and handbags um, initially I kind of got confused thinking that that's the same room but it's actually not in any event what I want to draw your attention to is besides what he said to the officer which you heard in the clip and I apologize for it being quite faint but um, he sort of said well I've got no idea how much she took and obviously actually the amount of clothing Shanann did take was was basically the shirt she was buried in, her bra and her, um, her, her um, thong that she was wearing and um, no shoes and th that that's another area where Chris Watts just hadn't really thought through his plan. He didn't even sort of, in terms of covering the fact that his wife had left, th there was no clothing that was missing and all he had to do in theory was take the bags of the of, of Sh well take Shanann's bag and dump it somewhere and it would look like she had arrived home with her bag and then left with the bag already packed um, but he wasn't thinking um, straight I guess the thing that I also want to highlight is when Chris watches in that closet he's got his back to his own shirts and there's a slight gap between the 
an orange shirt and a white shirt and that is something just worth focusing on for a second now if you keep an open mind there's nowhere behind him can you actually see the wall uh, in terms of it, looking through the shirt can you see the wall other than the gap between the orange shirt and the white shirt and that made me wonder was there a white sorry was it an orange shirt an orange t-shirt hanging on a hanger there that he removed and is that is that the orange shirt that that he was wearing at the conoco gas station on the cctv camera and that is highlighted in the discovery documents a uh, kind of a counter argument to that is wasn't he actually wearing a white shirt now bear in mind the orange and the white sort of neighbor one another in terms of the uh, the color coordinated t-shirts behind him uh wasn't he actually wearing isn't that a white shirt that that was removed from there and that's quite frustrating because we know he was actually at a another conoco gas station um wearing a white shirt after his date with nicole kessinger on the saturday night uh, we see him facing the camera wearing glasses um, and wearing a white shirt and and black trousers and and kind of black sandals but anyway that was certainly um, something that that i thought was quite kind of interesting on the day of the on the on, the, on this morning of the murders it looked like he may have changed his clothing as much as three times so he was wearing a dark blue um, shirt or sweater uh, in on the morning you know that is captured in Trinacita's CCTV camera then it looks like he may have worn an orange shirt some people have said that that is not him but you can actually see the style of him pushing his glasses on the top of his head which he has in this cupboard he also had it at Trinastich he has in the shop where he has his glasses um, kind of on onto a cap and it is interesting that he's wearing a cap um, maybe he was trying to shield himself from the sun when he was out at the well site bear in mind he was ultimately out at the well site until probably around about one o'clock so it would have been quite hot out there and yet he returns in a a gray a sort of a long sleeve gray shirt now why is he wearing a long sleeve gray shirt on a hot summer's day on a hot summer's day in the middle of summer in colorado what's also interesting is when kunrod talks to him and asks him you know the story you know what did she then say to him he sort of changes the subject kunrod and says you know what bank do you bank with which to me indicates that Kunrod just didn't believe him it was just like okay let's forget what you said let's get something more tangible um, let's find out you know what the money trail is with Shanann has she really disappeared now there, there were really two essentially two ways if you didn't know for sure where Shanann was to sort of figure out what what was the scenario the one was uh, check her phone find her phone see if there were calls she'd made in the last like one hour or two hours or something like that and ultimately they would find her phone and find there were no calls since she arrived that was definitely uh, a red flag and the other one would be has she made any transactions because if she had left on her own volition she would have drawn money and you know for a trip or for food or whatever now what is ironic with that is even if chris watch wanted to um, take one of shenan's cards and, and sort of draw cash to make it look like she was whatever she didn't have any money on her on her cards in fact one of them had bounced the previous night so that was not going to be very easy to do from the wardrobe the officer then kind of walks past chris watts into the bathroom and he sort of walks to the end of the bathroom turns and then chris watts sort of stands in like an alcove and he sort of
got his back to the one side of the there's sort of two basins each on either side of the alcove he's got his back to uh, the one side now it, it's a little bit frustrating that the investigator doesn't um, s sort of linger over these spots just for a couple of seconds just sort of bend over and linger over them um, I think that did happen maybe a little bit later but at this point he he doesn't sort of just get a a sense of what's going on in the bathroom now I think the reason for that is at a glance you can see that neither of those basins appeared to be used so it doesn't look like somebody brushed their teeth or if they did, they brushed their teeth and cleaned up um, everything. They cleaned up after themselves to the extent that you can't see toothpaste lying around. It doesn't look like anything happened there. It doesn't look like someone washed their hands or sort of cleaned makeup off their face and put something there. You know, you could also look in the trash under the basin if there was something like that for wipes or something. Bear in mind that there are the, the wipes that are at at the bedside table but they're unopened were there any wipes that were thrown away because Shanann had wiped her face we do know in what's his second confession he said that um, he one thing he remembered was the mascara coming down her face and I believe that is accurate that that and I don't think it's to do with her crying I think it's to do with what her face appeared like uh, after she died as, as sad as that, that image actually is. Uh, but that mascara wouldn't have been there if she'd removed it. Does that make sense? So in terms of the bathroom, I think it's just important to highlight that the bathroom seems to confirm that Shanann didn't sort of go upstairs, go into a bedroom, put a suitcase upstairs somewhere and you know, clean up before going into bed. That didn't happen, based on what we see in the bathroom. Now, I've had um, quite a few, I don't know if you want to call them arguments, I guess debates, discussions, where people say, if I was pregnant, I wouldn't carry the bag upstairs. Um, I disagree for a couple of reasons. One of them is, Shanann kind of toiletries were in that bag. Most people, when they fly, they, they take the essential toiletries with them. Um, they might have their cell phone charger with them. Um, they might have, um, you know, s some sort of essential stuff with them, including like a, a wallet or whatever it is. Um, the other thing is when you see her, and we will deal with this later in more detail, but when you see her walking up to the door, she actually takes a very wide step while she's holding this case. And I remember when I first tried to visualize Shanann arriving home, this was before the doorbell footage came out, I imagined that she would take the suitcase out of Nicole's car and, and put, put it on those wheels and sort of wheel it behind her. And so she had that that alternative, she had that option, but she didn't do that because she was kind of in a hurry. And in a way, I think Shanann's quite tough, meaning, you know, Watson tried to poison her twice. She was feeling quite sick, but she went to Arizona anyway. And I think lupus had kind of made her quite a tough person just in terms of um, f feeling physical pain and physical discomfort and just sort of taking it on the chin, you know, suffering, but being, you know, going through that. And, um, you know, she's relatively young, um, 34 years old. And I just, th my impression of Shanann is that she's quite a spirited woman and she would, she would walk up the stairs with the bag. And the Lifetime movie, I think, shows that, that Shanann sort of walks up the stairs and puts the bag on the inside of the um, uh, door and then immediately gets undressed and gets into bed and Chris Watts is in bed 
uh, already. Now, what I disagree with with a lifetime depiction is, first of all, the suitcase wasn't found upstairs. Second of all, um, the Chris Watts would never have slept in that bed that night. In fact, his last message to her was passed out on the couch. And that was kind of indicating where he was sleeping that night. One of the last things she did when he was, when they were in the same house, sleeping in the same house, which was, I think, August the 9th, she actually said, I kicked his sorry ass out of bed. She said, I'm not sleeping on the couch anymore. So it, it would be him sleeping on the couch. And she would have expected to find him on the loft couch. When she arrived home on the 13th, she would have expected to find him upstairs on the loft couch because it was, would have been necessary for him to monitor the children. And, and it kind of would be a case of, well, he's not going to monitor them from his own bedroom because that's where Shanann's going to sleep. So he'll monitor them just sort of outside their bedrooms, if that makes sense. And so that is where, in his message to her, um, holy crap, that's going to be late. Um, I'm sorry, I passed out on the couch. Um, she was going to assume that is where she was going to find him. And of course, that I don't think that is where he was. I think he, uh, he was uh, downstairs when she arrived. He would have had a very good idea when she was arriving um, because he would have seen it on his own uh, ring doorbell camera. But he would also have been able to time it. And he could basically, he could have slept in his basement bed until she arrived and then kind of come up the basement before, just before she arrived. And then he could have um, assailed her from behind with her expecting him in front of her, not behind her. Regardless of this sort of debate where you'd say, did Shanann make it to her bedroom or not? The fact is the suitcase was found below the stairs on the Tuesday and the next day it was found upstairs. It was found upstairs sort of inside the, the, the doorway. Now why the heck would he do that? Why the heck would he move the suitcase upstairs? Bear in mind he knows she's dead. Bear in mind he knows she's not coming back. So why would he do that? And I think one reason is he's already decided in his mind he's going to have to make um, the, the story that, that she went up to bed. And so, the, so that was something he'd neglected to kind of calculate was, you know, the, the suitcase. And so by moving it upstairs, he was almost, I guess, figuring that they wouldn't notice that. And, and maybe they wouldn't have noticed that except that they did have their body cam on. Another thing just to mention about the bathroom is, and this is also quite unfortunate, is that Kunrod doesn't go into every room in the bathroom. He sort of watch walks very quickly to the end of it and Kunrod follows him and then um, uh, Kunrod then goes out. Now, to me, but it, I could be biased, I could be sort of reading too much into it. To me, when... They're standing in the bathroom just after they were standing in the wardrobe. It seems to me that Watts is trying to both block Kunrod's view and distract him because you kind of see him waving his arms around kind of towards the bedroom. And he's kind of saying to Kunrod, you know, uh, should I go somewhere? You know, should I drive around? And it's at that point that Kunrod said, well, you wouldn't know what to look for. And Watts would later take that that response until everyone, well, uh, no, I haven't gone to look for it because I was told not to. Kunrod didn't say, um, don't go. He was just saying, well, kind of like, you wouldn't really know what to look for. And I think he was just sort of saying, you know, for right now, let's, let's try and figure things out. But uh, Kunrod wasn't saying, don't go and look for her. It was obviously um, what could, could have gone to look for her that night if he really didn't know where she was. And that was something Je uh, Jeremy Lindstrom wanted to do on Monday night when he went to Watts. He, he thought, well, let's go and look for her. And of course, Watts uh, didn't need to because he knew where she was. So anyway, the unfortunate thing is that 
Kunrod didn't look into the, I think it's uh, the toilet area, which is where the laundry, it's sort of a toilet shower area where the laundry basket was. And you only get a glimpse of this when Officer Lyons enters the bedroom the next day. So this is the 14th. And when she does, um, she kind of asks what, and this is also very interesting body cam to, to review is, she asks him, you know, do you have any articles that aren't basically contaminated with your scent? So in other words, something that is an item of clothing of Shanann's that isn't mixed with your clothing, something that is an article of clothing of the children that isn't mixed with your clothing. And right. And what for me was very, very suspicious there. I mean, obviously, we know that that Chris Watts is guilty, but just um, a, a, a big again a big red flag was he couldn't seem to find any items of clothing that that were that that he could give them to scent and I think that may have played into why the dogs had a bit of difficulty because what seemed to have washed everything and you know it even washed the, the the bedding of the of the children and so had he not done that the dogs could literally have just gone into the bedroom and sort of smelled a pillow or something like that. But because he'd washed that, now it became kind of quite difficult. I think in the end they got a scent off the children's shoes, but there was also a problem that he'd washed the shoes that they wore to the birthday party, which is the freshest scent that that they had had. Um, it's not actually clear if he washed them or that they came back from the birthday party wet because it was kind of like a, you know, they were playing in a swimming pool. But th but those shoes were outside drying um, when Officer Lines arrived. And that's now not just one day after the birthday party, but two days. I don't think that Coonrod saw shoes when he came around, but it's possible that he did. Uh, that, that's something that one of you guys can confirm if you like. So in any event, when uh, Officer Lines asks him, you know, for items of clothing he sort of again he leads the way and, and he starts touching things so she's asking him not to touch things and she's saying you know do you have any items of clothing that we can get sense from for the dogs and he sort of leads the way and he picks things up right and um, it's almost like he's contaminating things with his scent um, before that before the officer can get to them in any event he goes into the shower cubicle or the shower area and he picks up what looks like a pair of jeans out of the laundry basket and i would assume i don't know for sure but i would assume those are the jeans that shanann wore we just don't know so someone asked the question what happened to shanann's clothing we don't know whether those were the jeans he wore that day or the, the um how can i put it the Jean Shanann wore, but we you do you do see some jeans under the bed on I think the 16th, and it's fair I think to imagine that it could be the jeans from um, that that day that that were washed, but not necessarily. In any event, that's some that's definitely a missing part of the fragment. We don't have very clear footage of that laundry basket. We don't know what was in there. We don't know whether whether the shirt that she wore when she arrived was in there. I would presume that it wasn't and I would presume that he got rid of that, that he took that with to the well site and then he eventually dis disposed of it at the Black Mesa uh, 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 site. Someone said it's not pronounced Mesa, it's pronounced Masa or something. Um, well, you know, I actually studied geography. Where I'm from, it's pronounced Misa and it is spelled with an E. So that's just the way I know it. Um, just a difference in pronunciation. Just another area just where there's a difference is you guys talk about a closet and a wardrobe. Um, where I'm from, we talk about a cupboard. You know, you just put something in the cupboard, but it's the same thing. Where Americans talk about a, a jumper, we talk about a jersey. Just more of a sort of anglicized version. 
there's so many differences just in talking about ordinary things. Serviette, napkin, um, faucet and a tap, uh, a, um, the trunk of a car and the boot of a car and so on. So now we go into the bedroom, the proper bedroom area, and we, we look at the bed. And you, you only appreciate the kind of literally the cover-up of the bed when you compare the bed on the 13th to the bed on the 14th. On the 13th, it's completely stripped. There's nothing on it. There's not a single pillow on it. There's not a sheet on it. Nothing. It's just the... Um, the original sheet on it and then and that's it and one thing that that for me is quite strange is to me the sheet that goes onto the mattress is the fitted sheet so and I was led to believe that what is felt found at the well site was a fitted sheet so my question is the sheet that is found on the mattress in the bedroom, is that something he put on when he rushed into the bedroom in that minute? In other words, was that something he, he hurriedly did that he, he um, maybe the, 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 the original way that that bed presented itself was kind of like a jumble of, of sheets and a comfort and, and pillows or whatever. Some pillows with their covers on, others not. And so what he did was he just uh, threw everything into a corner very, very quickly, you know, because he didn't have a lot of time, ripped off the pillow covers and maybe um, maybe stuffed them into the trash. But I, I really don't know if he would run into the kitchen, um, given that Coonrod and Nicole Atkinson were sort of near the the front door able to look in I, I don't know if he would take that risk on the other hand um, you know I don't think the pillow covers were in the bedroom when they arrived so, so where did he put them what happened to them that's a little bit difficult to answer at this point it's possible that he stuffed that into the trash before he left that morning that's also possible because bear in mind, the kitchen was also clean as a whistle. And bear in mind, he barbecued Sunday night. So the fact that the kitchen is clean is quite interesting. It means he certainly cleaned up the kitchen. I do believe that he showered probably not once but twice. And that, that probably means he did um, clean up the surfaces of both the bathroom upstairs and the kitchen downstairs very very um, sort of thoroughly so anyway I, I just want to emphasize that that the sheet covering the bed in the upstairs bedroom I think wasn't the original sheet it, it the original sheet is what he used to transport Shanann in and that sheet match the kind of pattern of all the other bedding and if you look at the sheet that is on you know that you see on the bed it's it's kind of quite a kind of like a white sheet there's not much going on there also there's not much uh, uh, um, wrinkling or rippling on that on the sheet that's on the bed it doesn't really look like someone slept in it and certainly doesn't look like it that that sheet has been on the bed for very long does it Now, I do think a fitted sheet is quite a good um, thing to carry something as heavy as a cadaver in because it does fold around uh, roundish objects like a mattress. And Chris Watts chose that because the um, something like a, a garbage bag just wouldn't be strong enough to carry something so big and so heavy. And, and I apologize for talking in a little bit of a dispassionate way about what we're talking about. I am trying to just sort of take you through the crime scene evidence, but obviously we must bear in mind that th there was a vibrant life that, that you know, occupied this house and that includes Shannon and the children. One final thing just to bring up is the mere fact that the bed 
wasn't made and it was as unmade as it appeared was something that stood out to even someone like Nicholas Atkinson who'd previously babysat and previously house sat and I think Nic Nicole said the same thing that he was really neat so and Shanann was really neat so you would just never see beds in disarray in the Watts house. And now we move on to the next section dealing with the bedding. It might seem as though we've already dealt with it but I just want to deal with it in a bit more detail. So Nicholas was asked you know what um, pattern did he notice and he said it, it was sort of white with blue lines. It's sort of more accurately white with sort of lots of speckled blue and gray squares or dots. And if I was a documentary filmmaker, I would try to visually show a kind of a mirror image between the pattern on the on the on the bedding and the sort of the pattern of the well sites in Colorado um, because in a weird way and because I'm quite a visual person I'm also a photographer in a weird way when you look at a grid map just of the of the fracking activity in Colorado you see a heck of a lot of little dots. Uh, I'm not sure if I've got the original that I've, I've seen where it just shows just a number of active wells and so on, but it's like a incredible, it almost looks like a city where you just see thousands of little dots all over the place. And that made me think of the blanket and the fact that Shanann ended up and the children ended up kind of buried in oil and buried in this sort of fracking infrastructure and that they were actually sleeping under fabric that that sort of resembled that I just saw a kind of a bitter and horrible irony and and I would have liked to have emphasized that the other thing to emphasize is when the officers returned to the scene and obviously at this time what's it now you know, there was a strip bed, but now it is all made up. There's a comforter on it and there were pillows on it, uh, obviously laundered and so on. But besides that, there was also some of Shanann's clothing. And it just makes you wonder why the heck would he put Shanann's clothing on the bed? And just to be explicit, the, the um, one item of clothing is the same hoodie that she wore there you can see it. It's sort of gray, a gray hoodie, Lavelle branded. Um, it's the same one that she wore when she went to Arizona. And it's the same one she wore on the beach in San Diego. Now we're going to look at the bedside table. I believe it was one of Shanann's parents said that it was Shanann's habit that her devices were always on. So her phone was always charging kind of next to her bed and I think her eye watch as well was also always charging so she would never sort of um, turn it off or leave it somewhere or um, allow the battery to fail um, because she used these devices so um, almost addictively they were always charging and they were always charged. But something worth looking at is whether the baby monitor was plugged in to begin with. So although it was what's a story that, you know, he in, in his first confession, he said, well, he realized what Shanann was doing. He saw it through the baby monitor. And I think that's almost code for him seeing Shanann arriving home. Bear in mind, this is a premeditated crime. He saw Shanann arriving home on his phone um, through the ring doorbell app kind of thing. And we know that he said the same thing when he was at the well site. He said that he saw Nicole Atkinson at his door. And he then he called her and he said, you know, why are you messing with my door? He was able to see what was going on um, in the front of the door remotely. 
And so why wouldn't he do that when Shanann arrived home? So from what I've been able to retrieve online, it does look like the summer baby monitor was plugged in at the time. Now we move on to the bedroom floor, which to me is perhaps the um, most significant area in terms of the bedroom as a crime scene, which I think is quite ironic. I don't think there's very much to look at in the bedroom or the bathroom or the closet. Um, there's small little areas that are worth looking at. I think the, the biggest thing that is worth knowing is just that the bed sheet, you know, the fitted sheet found at the well site was sourced from the bed. But besides that, there's nothing really of tremendous significance in the bedroom. Um, a lot of people think that because of that, it means Shanann died. In, in other words, she died on the bed with the sheet under her and what's then wrapped it around her. People don't imagine that he fetched the sheet kind of thing. And that, that is what he needed to cover up when he went in the in, in, into the, the house ahead of everybody else. Because just think about it, if he didn't have time to cover up what was going on on the bed, if he didn't have time, wouldn't he have um, stripped the bed the way that he did? On the other hand, if he did have time, wouldn't he have just made the bed up so that it looked like nothing happened there? Conversely, if he had lots of time and lots of time to think about it, wouldn't he have made the bed up and made it look like someone slept in it? But bear in mind at that point, that wasn't part of his version. His version, in fact, one of his first version was that Shanann arrived home, they had an argument in the middle of the night and then she left. So one of his first versions kind of acknowledged that she didn't actually sleep in the bed. But then he had to make room for the fact that... Um, he probably was concerned by the speed at which things were going that they probably were going to find the the bed sheet. And so now he had to talk about her coming home and making it a little bit different. In any event, th uh, you kind of have um, the upstairs bedroom looking quite different when the officer returns. It's kind of, the bed's been made, the the debris on the ground has been uh, picked up and packed away. And as I mentioned earlier, guess what is up in the bedroom wall, Shanann's suitcase. And not only that, Watts is sort of pretending that he's, that's where he wants to sleep. He wants to sleep in the master bedroom. Now, bear in mind, when Shanann was alive, he didn't want to sleep in the master bedroom. He didn't want to um, kind of be where Shanann was because he wanted to be with Kessinger. Also, he didn't really want to be in the house. He wanted to be with Nicole Kessinger. So if he was at home, he, he would want to maybe exercise and eat. And then he would, when he was going to sleep, he wanted to go to Kessinger to sleep. So he wasn't particularly interested in being in that bed and he was really not interested in being in that bed with Shanann. Now, I think one of the most significant pieces of evidence in the bedroom, on the bedroom floor, uh, are the what looks like a purple sleep mask that moved from the um, floor of the bedroom to what appears to be the bed in the basement. And that was on the 14th, so that some things were, were moving upstairs, other things were moving downstairs. Something else that moved downstairs were the Chorin suitcases. They also ended up in the, um, in the uh, basement. As far as I remember, they were originally, but I could be wrong on this point, they weren't originally in the basement right in the beginning, but as I said, I could be wrong. Um, but certainly the purple sleep mask moved, looks like it moved from the bedroom to the basement and, and then, and then there's the other blue nitrile glove, which appears, uh, that really does look like a, 
blue nitrile glove and it appears next to the boot of the officer. I'm not 100% sure of this footage. I think if you if you do a YouTube search for... Um, it could be the blankets, the, the, the kiddies blankets. Then you might find this particular video. It's not very easy to find. But that does look like the other blue nitrile glove. And, and obviously it wasn't under the bed. It was looks like it was under the pillows. You can kind of see what looks like. It could be a comforter and it could be, um, uh, you know, pillows that are kind of in the corner there. I can't quite remember which corner this was in, but it was certainly um, sort of in one of the corners. Uh, something else to mention is if Shanann took that top to Arizona, it means Watts had to have taken, opened, the, opened Shanann's suitcase, taken Shanann's top out, and then put it back on the bed. And one wonders why he did that. One possibility is maybe wanted to seed the bed with her DNA. I do think the blue nitrile gloves are a very big clue. I think it's been very much underreported, underestimated, because if you're going to commit a crime as cleanly and as sort of almost professionally as what it did, then you know without leaving your DNA and without getting DNA on yourself. Um, something like those blue nitrile gloves are going to minimize the uh, injury that you're going to get and also minimize to some extent the injury you're going to inflict on the person, in this case Shanann. I believe one uh, additional explanation for why Watts had no defensive wounds is because he was wearing probably a mask, almost like a balaclava, you know, like a, something covering his face and that he was wearing gloves and virtually his entire body was covered in clothing with the exception of his neck and that is where he suffered an, uh, an injury like a little neck which when he was asked about it he said it was a mosquito bite but that was a very fresh wound that was visible during the sermon on the porch okay we had about 47 minutes uh, thank you for listening if you're finding this analysis interesting, I'll be back doing another analysis, this time of the kitchen, in the next episode. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Like, share, leave a comment. If you share, please use the hashtag TCRS. And I'll see you guys next time.